All right, so good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, I'm Daisha, I'm the Assistant Head of Admissions at the Institute for Advanced Analytics. And I just wanted to thank you for taking the time to join us for another Exploring Data Science webinar. Um, as you may know, Exploring Data Science um, is an initiative we have aimed at increasing the awareness of data science careers, as well as educating you a bit on some tools you can use to um, prepare yourself to become an effective data science in the future. Um, for today's webinar, we have Dr. Sarah Egan Warren from the Institute joining us today. Um, Dr. Egan Warren is a teaching assistant professor at the Institute for Advanced Analytics, and she has built from the ground up our communications training for our students here. Um, and so if you don't know, we have communication specialists on staff who work with our students on all forms of professional speaking and writing skills. And one of the things we teach our students is that the insights they come up with may not be as valuable to their company or their organization if they're not able to communicate what it really means. And so Dr. Egan Warren is here with us today to share some strategies on how to tell a story using the data that you have worked on so hard. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Sarah Egan Warren. Thanks, Daisha, and welcome everyone. This is Strategies for Storytelling with Data. I've spent my career really working with technical people, undergraduate and graduate students, faculty and staff, industry professionals, helping them to hone their communication skills, both writing and speaking. And what I have seen over the years, over and over again, is that there is an assumption that data and facts stand on their own. And as a result, I spent much of my time trying to convince people that this just isn't true. It is dangerous to assume that when you show data to an audience that they are going to see it the same way that you do. So let's look at a slide to give you an example and illustrate what I mean. So here we have a slide with 61 points of data on it. And although I know what this slide is indicating, you would be pretty hard pressed to figure out what it is. Now, if we spend enough time on here, you could follow around from point one, two, three, four, five, and all the way around to, to point 61, and, and you'd be able to get a general idea. But the strategy of using storytelling techniques starts helping fill in some of that information. So we start connecting the dots, and it's still a little unclear, but the more storytelling you add to your data, the clearer that picture becomes and the more strategies you apply to your presentation, we start getting a better and clearer image until you have used all of your storytelling strategies to connect your audience to the full picture. Now, storytelling builds a narrative around your data and helps your audience understand and remember what you're saying. And there is so much we could talk about, but since we have just a short time together, I'm going to focus on three specific strategies that you could use right now that you could start using that data analysts use very effectively in order to get their point across to their audience. So let's look at those three strategies. They are bluff, ethos, logos, and pathos, and message map. So we're going to start off with bluff. And bluff means bottom line up front. And this is sort of the idea of beginning with your most important information so that you bring your audience in and get them on board with your idea before really going into the body of the presentation. So just a few moments ago, I shared with you my bluff, right? That storytelling connects your audience to the data and gives us this full picture. And when you start with that bottom line, your audience knows what to expect and they aren't spending their time thinking up what they assume you're trying to tell them. Instead, they are following along with your story. To illustrate this, I want to show you a story arc that we could map out for something like a murder mystery. You know, we open up a story or a movie or a TV show that's a murder mystery with people, place, plot, and purpose, right? In that exposition, we meet a group of friends who are high school buddies who've come back for a reunion and they're gonna go to an all-inclusive resort. And then there's some rising action because at the resort, there's some shady things going on and some strange occurrences until we get to the climax where 
the butler stabs one of the reunion goers and kills her in the kitchen and then the the killer is caught and then we have that falling action of the trial and then the resolution as those who survived live happily ever after so that's that murder mystery arc where we're going along and we're trying to figure out what's happening because that's why we want to watch or read about the murder mystery we're we're in it for the suspense we're in it to try and figure out what's going on that is not the best organization for a data analyst to use because if you're allowing your audience to try and figure out what you've already discovered what you've already analyzed what you've already come to a conclusion about when you finally get to that climax when you finally get to that point they may not be on board with you and you're going to have more work to do in persuading them to believe that your analysis is correct so i recommend to data scientists and data analysts always to think of the bottom line upfront story arc when preparing for a presentation and what that means is we switch from going up this big arc to wait for the really exciting point we put that in the very beginning the takeaway is what you start your presentation with and again at this presentation we started with that takeaway about how important storytelling is to connect your audience to the data and give them the full picture so you start with the takeaway you forecast what's coming up next you have your three main points you can have more than three points you can have fewer than three points i think three is a magic number but you want to make sure those three points support your takeaway and then you finish your presentation with the next steps of what to do next an actionable thing that your audience can do and that takeaway that bottom line is connected to the main points and connected to the next step so when we compare them and we look at them together we see that you know it takes a long time to get to the main point for a murder mystery but when bottom line up front we get that main point right away and one of the sort of anecdotal pieces of evidence that I have to support this, other than it's easier to persuade an audience if you already have convinced them uh, in the beginning that your point is valid, is that it is very common to go into a meeting where you think you have a 45 minute presentation or maybe half an hour, or maybe an hour, and the person who can decide, the highest ranking officer, the, the boss says, look, I've got called into another meeting, I got 10 minutes, what, what's, what's the takeaway here? If you have already organized your message into bottom line up front, you have that ready to go. And that person, the de decision maker, the, the person who's going to be able to give you the funds or the resources for what you're suggesting or recommending, that person's going to be able to hear that message before he or she needs to leave to go to the next meeting. So it is setting up your audience for success and for your success as well. So the story arc is just one way, this bottom line up front story arc is just one way to think about stories. And I have three that I would recommend if you are interested, if this topic you know, makes you want to find out more. These are three different talks that if you just Google their names, you will find them very quickly. Uh, the first is Nancy Duarte, who talks about what is versus what could be. Now, she's talking more about keynote speakers or political speeches or inspirational speeches, but there's still the bottom line up front. It's where you have the what is versus what could be. And then it becomes a wave of what is, what could be, what is, what could be. And we always come back to that bottom line up front. And we have this wave situation throughout the rest of the presentation to draw your audience in and to get them on board with that takeaway. Uh, the second speaker who talks about story models is Gar Reynolds. And Gar talks about the ideal, starting off that bottom line up front of the ideal situation, and then contrasting it with reality, which is very similar to Nancy Duarte's what is versus what could be, discussing the problem, and then really wrapping up with that solution. And then we have the ideal and the solution connecting with each other, almost like bookends, where we start with that ideal situation. And at the end, the solution is the action items in order to create that ideal situation. 
The third speaker is Melissa Marshall, and she has a great TED Talk called Talk Nerdy to Me. And she actually came to NC State a couple of years ago and talked about this analogy of snorkeling versus scuba diving that I just love so much and I like to share anytime that I have an audience who are thinking about storytelling techniques. So what Melissa Marshall said is if you think about when you're snorkeling, you know, you're on the surface of the water and you're looking down at the reef and all you need are, is your mask and your snorkel and, and flippers would be nice, makes it easier, but you're seeing that big picture. So you start off with the big takeaway. And then when you want to dive down and get a closer look, you can take a deep breath, dive down deep, get close down to the reef, check out what you need to see, but you're not going to stay down there long. You're going to come back up and sort of reorient yourself. So again, we're, we're having this same pattern that Nancy Duarte and Gar Reynolds are talking about, sort of a wave pattern, which also works with the ocean metaphor. I'm really liking the connections here. But the snorkeler doesn't need a lot to be able to see the big picture, dive down deep for a moment, get some more details, and then come back up. Now, to contrast that with a scuba diver, a scuba diver needs training, special equipment, uh, and they can dive down and stay down for a long time. So not everyone can be part of that scuba diving presentation because they may still be up there on the top snorkeling. And so her idea is that you need to make sure that you know what your audience needs, how you can give them the big picture, dive down deep, and then come back to that big picture. So I really hope that as we're talking about bottom line up front, that you think that, wow, this, this could be a game changer for presentations because it really gets your audience on board and focused on your ideas and can help really structure a presentation in your favor. So let's move on to strategy number two. So strategy number two is using ethos, logos, and pathos. And I hope somewhere in the back of your mind, there's some little spark going off from high school or freshman English, or maybe a philosophy class that you took that you remember these ethos, logos, and pathos. This is how we persuade people. These are the three means of persuasion. I'm gonna talk about each one of them and show you how they can be used in a presentation about data to help your audience understand and be persuaded that your analysis would be the best that they can adapt or use. So let's start off with ethos. So ethos is, we get the words like ethical from it, right? So your ethos is your credibility, your character, you show your ethos in the vocabulary that you use while uh, you're, you can talk about your expertise or your qualifications. So it's really easy in an academic setting for that to happen. Daisha introduced me and gave you my title, the kind of work I do. She also you know, gave a little understanding about how we use communication at the Institute and how important it is for data scientists and data analysts to use good communication skills because it doesn't matter how good of an analyst you are. If you cannot tell the public, your boss, your client, or your coworkers what you found out and how you found it out, it, it doesn't matter. No one's gonna see that analysis. So when I am thinking about a presentation, I'm always thinking about you as my audience. And you're clearly interested in data science and data analytics. And so my focus for this whole presentation is how data scientists use storytelling techniques successfully. And so that builds my ethos throughout the entire presentation. So that's the first ethos. Second is logos. And this is where we get the word logic from. These are facts and proof and statistics, numbers and reason and logic. And this is where most data analysts and data scientists feel the most comfortable. This is their zone. This is where they want to slap up a p-value and be like, look at that, and just leave it there. And this can be very problematic. And this is why we want to combine them. We want to combine ethos and logos and the third one, pathos. 
pathos, we get empathy, the word empathy from pathos. These are meaningful stories. This strategy means that you're inspiring, that you're trying to connect on an emotional level. And this is the one that most often data scientists and data analysts don't feel as comfortable using, but it's really, really powerful to tell a story that makes a connection to humans. Most often the data that we are analyzing represent human beings. And it's really easy when you are analyzing literally, and I'm using the word literally to mean literally, literally millions of lines of data. It is easy to forget that each data point is a human. So the most persuasive you can be is if you combine all three, that you use your credibility and your ethos. You use your logic that you have developed as a data scientist or as a data analyst, and you use pathos to bring in a story to remind us about the human connection to that data. So we've talked about our second one, ethos, logos, and pathos. And so we're gonna move on to our next one, our third strategy, which is message map. Now, this is where we want to think about the structure of our story and how we can use this structure to really create presentations as data analysts that are going to be persuasive and clear for our audience. I'm going to start off showing you what I use for any sort of presentation. This is what is in my mind when I think about creating a new presentation. This is my message map. We start off with that bottom line. And again, we'll use this as an example from today is that you know, data needs stories to connect with the audience. That's the bottom line. We then forecast what's coming up. This is really key for an audience to know what to expect. So I started with my bottom line and then I told you I was gonna give you three strategies that you could start using right now in whatever sort of presentation that you might have to be giving. So the forecast really establishes the setting and the story arc or the plot, and it lets your audience have a picture of where we're going. We then have our three main points. And again, I'm a little obsessed with three. It's very important in organizing principle. You could have more, you could have fewer points. And then you wrap up with next steps or, or what to do with that information. So that's a very basic structure. And in fact, this structure could be used for an email. It could be used for answering a question in class. It could be used for writing a report. This same idea of bottom line up front, most important takeaway, and then supported that information and then action item of what to do next is a really great structure that can get your audience to believe what you are saying. Now, I do wanna point out that it's really key that all of these things are connected. So the bottom line is connected to the forecast and the forecast is connected to the main point and to the second point and the third point, which is also connected to the forecast and back to the bottom line and to the next steps. These message maps help you organize. And as you are using a message map, you may find that some information just doesn't seem to fit within the message map. And that is really important because a good data analyst will realize that if this doesn't fit here, we're not going to try and cram it in there. There's two things you can do. You can just delete it because it doesn't support your bottom line, or you could use it as a hidden slide or even an appendix to your presentation so that in case someone asks about it, you have it available, but it's not part of your main message because if it does not support the bottom line, you need to kick it out of there. It's not going to help your presentation. And that's how things can start meandering and getting really fuzzy and not focused on your audience and focused on that bottom line. So ultimately your message map helps you reinforce the story. It forces you to only include information in your presentation that's going to be relevant for your audience. Now, this is how I think of it but it's not the only way to think of a message map. And just like I showed you the Nancy Duarte and Gar Reynolds and Melissa Marshall, I wanna show you a number of different message maps that 
maybe appeal to you more. Maybe the boxes and that layout and organization doesn't work for you. But these are different ways to conceive of a message map. And I encourage you to think about how you consider in your mind what a presentation looks like. What I want you to take away from this slide is that each one of these message maps has the bottom line up front, right? Whether it's in a linear process, whether it's like a flow chart, whether it's like a mind map or a path or an inverted pyramid, each one of these starts with the bottom line up front. And, and that is just the key to getting connected to your audience. Now, I want to transition away from talking at you and showing you what data analysts use in terms of visualizations and how they can use these three strategies. So this is a very typical visualization of a customer journey. And there's a lot going on here. And clearly, when you put up a slide like this, the people in the audience start trying to figure out what they can analyze from this. And the first job that a data analyst has to do in sharing a visualization is to orient the audience to what they're looking about, to what they are looking at. So we would start looking at this as the journey from account opening to the welcome, to the login, to maybe the call center, and then what happens next. But in order to keep your audience focused, if the point of this slide, of this visualization for you as the data analyst was to discuss the call center, then that's what we want to call attention to. So the bottom line up front is that we would circle that call center and say, we want to focus on the 12 million people who make it to the call center. And then what happens to them? Do they drop? Do they do an account change? Or do they close their account? Your ethos, you develop that by how well you explain what the audience is seeing and you lead them through. Your logos, of course, is the use of the numbers. So we see that we started with 16.5 million over here. We moved down to then here into, do they log in? Do they use the website or the mobile app? And we have those numbers there to support. In terms of using pathos, you could talk about a single customer as a use case and walk through with that customer about what it felt like and what was going on with them through each one of these steps. So that's one example of what a data analyst might be working with. This is a very typical dashboard for a customer journey analytics to monitor KPIs. And there's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to look at. And so one of the first things that a data analyst can do to help focus the story is to gray out all the information that is not relevant to that bottom line up front. So it helps focus the audience and then we can isolate it and then we can make it bigger and we can talk about what's the difference between the repeat sales after a coupon versus the repeat sales after a reward. And these customer journey analytics are really helpful to see the big picture, but you want to focus in on what that bottom line up front is and again, this could be a great use of pathos here to walk through with what one customer looks like. Now, of course, data analytics is not all about just tracking customer uses. We also, data analysts, can look at social justice issues. And again, we have a visualization that is really complex with lots of information. And when we put up a visualization like this, it's important to orient our audience to what we're looking at, that these are gay rights by type in the states, in the United States, and then by, and they're grouped by sections of the United States. But again, we want to focus on that bottom line up front. So we're going to really go into the Southeast and we're going to look specifically at North Carolina. We're going to talk about that, what that means. And then we're going to pull back again, sort of like the snorkeling. We dove down for a moment. Now we're coming back up for a big picture. And then talk about what that means for the particular audience who is looking at this visualization. It's all about the audience too. We could have a whole nother talk about audience analysis. So the next example shows that visualizations don't have to be complex to tell a really important story. Here we have a really simple line graph. Uh, 
but we still have bottom line up front. And in fact, this example actually uses a sentence as the heading in order to identify the most important information. And here you're using ethos, logos, and pathos to persuade your audience to understand what this means and how to interpret the findings within a specific context, right? Because it's going to be based on your audience. Again, audience, audience, audience. Are you talking to community stakeholders? Are you talking to police officers, educators, policymakers, or other data analysts? And in fact, let me put in a little plug just for a moment. There was last week, we had our Exploring Data Science series that alumni and current students from the Institute shared their recommendations for books about data ethics and algorithmic justice. If you are interested in that topic, I highly recommend checking out last week's Exploring Data Science series on our YouTube channel that it was recorded and it has some great recommendations for further reading if this interests you. And next up, we have some overall trends, which is something, of course, a data analyst thinks about a lot. And so these are Google trends for the year in search for 2020. And of course, we are looking at ethos, logos, and pathos. If we focus, in, I'm sorry, bottom line up front, of course, bottom line up front first. Why did I say ethos, logos, and pathos first? Bottom line up front first that we would want to focus in on let's look at the months of March and April and what were people searching on Google Trends. If we look a little closer at this paragraph up in the top, we see that the author, Rushan Khan, talks about the where he got this data. So there we got logos. We got some ethos about how he did it, how he gathered the data how we visualized it, and then pathos, of course, where he's talking about how these search terms relate both directly and indirectly to the coronavirus pandemic. So we've got all the things right here uh, in this one very simple but informative visualization. So I'm going to wrap up with this example that is a very well-known visualization created by uh, the American Kennel Club. And whenever we use this visualization, the same thing happens to the audience members. They read the title, right? Best in show, the ultimate data dog. And maybe you start thinking about your childhood dog or your current dog or a neighbor's dog or a dog you liked or hated. And you start trying to find them on the plot. Are they inexplicably overrated? Are they hot dogs? Are they rightly ignored? Are they overlooked treasures? Now, I will tell you right now, there are 197 dog breeds recognized by the AKC and this visualization clearly does not have all 197. So Val, I'm really sorry, your Welsh Terrier is nowhere on this chart. Although I'm sure you would plot him far up there on the right hand corner under hot dogs. And if you have a rescue dog or if you have a mixed breed dog, you're also not going to find your dogs on here because think about the source. This is the American Kennel Club and they are putting together this information about their dog breeds. So when we know what, I'm sorry, I'm laughing at Val's uh, comment in the chat, uh, when we know what audience members do is that they're trying to figure things out about their own experiences. We know that we have got to get to that bottom line up front very quickly. So we would focus in on this upper quadrant of hot dogs. And for this particular thing, we're going to look at this border collie here because maybe you are doing work for a nonprofit border collie organization rescue. And you could use this visualization to help highlight what a great dog a border collie could be. Uh, you could tell a story supported by the data where you would walk through what the data source was for this visualization that you were looking at intelligence, cost, longevity, grooming, ailments, and appetite, and then plotting them along this line. Then we could also talk more to the audience about the intelligence of the dogs. So up here, we see that if dogs are pointing to the right, that they are clever and dogs pointing to the left, they say dumb. And I feel really bad about that. I'm gonna say less clever if they're pointing to the left. They are also by size and then they're grouped by color of the categories that the AKC lists dogs in. So 
Here we've used our bottom line up front. We've used our ethos by explaining our expertise and putting this together. We've used logos. So we've talked about our data. And then we have pathos where maybe you could walk through a story about how matching rescue dogs with the right family improves placement in forever homes. We can incorporate all of these storytelling techniques into talking through this visual. And that's what successful data analysts do when they are visualizing their information in order to persuade their audience. So that is how you can use the three storytelling techniques with this visualization. And for all of you listening who are not dog people, we're gonna zoom in here. I'll call your attention to this quadrant and see that there was a cat there all the time and included it as a hot dog of in this visualization. So to wrap us up, I just wanna remind you how you can use these three storytelling techniques to connect your audience to your data. Start with your bottom line up front, combine the use of ethos, logos, and pathos, and use a message map, whichever message map will work for you. Use a message map to structure, to support your story, and to make your message clear to your audience. Thank you so much for listening, and I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, thank you, Dr. Egan Warren. Um, if we could all give her a virtual hand of applause by using your reactions or clapping on camera. Um, we wanna thank you for a wonderful presentation this afternoon. Um, I do wanna open it up for any questions you all have. So please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to speak on camera or ask your questions in the chat. Um, and it looks like we have one um, question ready. Um, Gagan, please feel free to unmute yourself. Okay. So my one question is, it's about the different types. How frequently are these different types combined? Is it all the time or is it most of the time? Do you mean uh, the different types of persuasion, like ethos, logos, and pathos? Um, yes, either that or the different types like bluff, ethos, logos, and pathos, and message map. Oh, so they should be com all the time, right? You should use all of them all the time. Right, you could always start your presentation off with that clear bottom line up front, and you want to think about how you're going to persuade your audience with your credibility, with your logic, and with your emotional appeal. And then that message map is going to help you structure that story. Is that answering your question? I'm not sure I, I am. No, that's perfect, actually. Thank you okay. so much. Sure. All right, I believe Josh Hull was next. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear hey. you, Josh. Hey, um, I was curious also about the uh, different methods of storytelling. Uh, do you always, you mentioned you always use the bottom line up front uh, method. Do you think that there are, every person should really take one method and adapt that and make that their go-to? Or are there situations in which it makes sense to kind of switch back and forth and use a different methodology, whether it's, you know, the... Um, sort of wave and going back and forth and do different storytelling methods um, lend themselves to one method or another. Yeah, Josh, that's or a great question. Another. And I have the most frustrating answer. It's called, it depends. So it's going to depend on your audience. And most often the kinds of presentations that data analysts are expected to do are to you know, businesses who are asking for a solution, either, either as consultants or as an internal analytics department, they've asked you as the analyst to solve a problem. And if that's the situation, you want to start with the bottom line up front, answer it for them, and then provide the details of how you did it and use that ethos, logos, and pathos. Are there times when it's going to be better to tell the journey of how you got there? Sure. We, there are situations where as a data analyst, you may be asked to create a process. And so your audience might want to know, okay, you tried this and it didn't work. So you tried that. You tried A and that didn't work. So you tried B and C and, oh, you discovered D worked. Then that could be like the murder mystery or like the up and down, but it's going to depend on what your audience needs from you. 
even if you are trying to lead them on a journey, you still want to start them off with that most important information. Start them with that bottom line and then take them on the journey. Okay. That makes sense. And I assume also um, kind of follow up to that with the snorkel versus scuba diving analogy you used before uh, that snorkeling would be more of the method you would want to use for decision makers or somebody who's kind of in a high up trying to get the point across. Whereas the scuba diving one might be more internal if you were working with other data analysts or data scientists and Absolutely. trying to go through your methodology and make sure that it's actually appropriate and that you're doing it the right way. Yes, um, absolutely, be... John. Okay. Yes, Great. and it all is about audience, right? So the more you know about your audience and where they are, how technically savvy are they? How, how well-versed are they in analytics? then you can decide if you're just going to take that big picture and dive down sometimes, or you're going to go deep and stay down there for a while. Great. Thank you. And thank Thanks. you for the presentation. It was really helpful. Thanks. I'm glad you're here. Great question and application you gave there, Josh. Um, our next question comes from Carlos. Hi, Carlos. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, just a clarification question in, in terms of the message map that you presented. Uh, can you clarify the forecast part? I didn't really get that uh, well. And then the second question will be, what about when you have to combine you know, good news and bad news? Uh, uh, is there any, any way that you can do that in a storytelling, I guess? Yes, Thank okay, you. Carlos, those are great questions. Uh, first up about a forecast. A forecast is just letting your audience know what's coming up. So it often is achieved in an agenda slide and you say, we're gonna talk about these three things or we're gonna cover the journey or we're gonna talk about the, our five recommendations. So that forecast is just telling your audience the, the structure so that they know what to expect. When you're looking at a document and you use the document design to see, okay, there's some headings, there's some bulleted lists, you kind of get a feeling of how the story is going to go. You know how long it is. We don't have those same cues in a presentation. And so that forecast helps your audience know, okay, she's going to talk about three things. We've got three strategies to get through and, and kind of gives a, a framework of what to expect. Does, does that help with forecast? Good. Okay. So your second question about what if you have bad news? And like I told Josh, um, it depends. So one of the first it depends is about your audience. Are, are they expecting that there's going to be bad news? Uh, if that's the case, then you can just rip that Band-Aid off and start with that and say, yes, just like you feared, our numbers are down from uh, you know 2020 because the world is in a pandemic. And just get to the point and let that be the bottom line. And here are the solutions of how we're going to move forward in 2021. So, so that's one approach. Um, culturally, some cultures prefer to get right to the point. Some cultures prefer that it is softened and there is a kind of buffer around it. Uh, some cultures don't want to be told negative information in a meeting that way. So knowing your audience and how they're going to receive that information is really important. Hopefully, if there is bad news, the first time that bad news is being shared is not in a presentation, right? Hopefully it's been in a meeting or in discussions, but if you have to be the one to share bad news in a presentation, once you have a better understanding of what your audience needs or wants, then you can adjust depending on what is going to be most effective. Great, thank you. All right, thank you, Carlos. Our next question comes from Steven. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I had a quick question about the dashboards because for dashboards, I know that you get a lot of information on there and it sometimes becomes difficult to highlight specific points that you had. You showed us one strategy where you kind of grade out some of the other points to bring out some of the specific graphics. Do you have any other strategies that you follow for that? Sure. So if you're using Tableau, you can use a story, right, to walk through little pieces of it instead of showing the entire dashboard altogether, because that can be really overwhelming. The, the other strategy is to pick 
a case, a use case, right? Pick one person or client or product and show that instead of everything altogether. And then you can build up, right? So we can look at very complex slides and understand them, but it's when we are bombarded with a lot of information at once and we're not sure where to focus or, or where to put our attention is when we lose our audience. So it would be great to build it up and it can become that very complex and look at that whole entire dashboard by the end, as long as we've really established an understanding of what we're looking at. Now, it's also going to be dependent on your audience. If your audience is very well versed in looking at dashboards, they're not gonna feel overwhelmed by that. They're, the bells and whistles, they can look past that and really focus in on what you want them to pay attention to. It's much more the case for someone who doesn't actively use Tableau, for example, or, and isn't in a dashboard on a regular basis that it can feel overwhelming. Thank you. You're welcome, Stephen. All right, we have another question from Gagan. Thank you. So my question for you, Dr. Egan Warren is, I know that data visualization is a big part of presenting findings. So I'm curious, what is your favorite data visualization tool or package? Um, definitely Tableau is the one that we use most often, and it is very powerful. There are many others. Um, to be honest, that's the one I'm comfortable with. Uh, but, you know, Excel also can create things pretty nicely. Uh, and our students use a, a wide variety of whatever they feel most comfortable with. But we do teach Tableau here at the Institute. And uh, we have Dr. Da um, Dr. Christopher Healy, who is a visualization expert here. And so he talks a lot about uh, visualization, about color theory, and how to apply those to your visualizations. Great. Thank you again. All right. Now we have a question from Ezra. Yeah. Uh, my question, I guess, builds a little bit on what Stephen just asked. Um, going back to how to make sure you're not overwhelming an audience with what you're presenting and everything, if you map out this great presentation and um, you know you have a wonderful story and a wonderful line that you're following through and a nice stream of consciousness and everything how do you make sure that whenever you're presenting that visually that your audience isn't getting sucked into what's being presented visually and they're still getting the most out of the presentation and what you're actually saying as well yeah so that's called reading the room and we have to change that to reading the zoom for right now that if you look out at your audience and you see that they are distracted or there's no more nodding of heads or you can see someone taking notes and you can ask if you need to stop, you can redirect, you can spend more time on a visual. There is a frustration level of when you've crafted this beautiful presentation and then you get interrupted, which always happens in a business presentation. It is very unusual for you to be able to start and finish a business presentation without someone asking a question, telling you to go back, wanting you to dig deeper into something. And that's exactly what happens here at the Institute when our students are presenting to the faculty and we ask them, we're like, no, 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 go back, explain this more, tell us what's going on. Why did you choose this? because we're wanting to prepare them for what happens in the workplace. And one of the stories we hear every single year when our students go out to present their final project. So instead of a thesis, you know, our students do a practicum project and they present their findings to their sponsor at the end of the year. And oftentimes they have this beautifully crafted presentation that's 45 minutes long. It has gone through review, a dry run. It's been presented to the faculty. They've presented to Dr. Rappa, our director. And then they go to present and they open up, they show their bottom line. They've created, for example, Stephen, a dashboard. And the sponsors are so excited by what they see. They're like, oh no, no, wait, if you click on that customer, what happens? Oh no, I knew that, I knew. And it becomes a conversation and the team is like, no, we have this beautiful presentation to give it. Nope. The presentation just got kicked to the side because it's about what the audience wants. If the audience wants to spend an hour clicking through the dashboard, which is the deliverable, then that is what you should do. And that audience is going to leave going, that team was brilliant. That was the greatest presentation we've ever seen. 
and it wasn't a presentation, right? It was a conversation, which is actually really the point, right? We do all this practice so that we can have an interaction and be a, have a meaningful conversation with our audience. Awesome, thank you so much. Great, now we have a question from Karthik. Yeah, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Karthik. Yeah, thank you for the excellent presentation. So I have a doubt, like uh, I completely understand when you say it's about the audience, it's uh, uh, you have to read the audience, but the, and you have to understand the audience. So I have a question, like when we are presenting and our audience is going to be uh, from different varieties, like I have, uh, 80% of the people like analyst and only 20% from the actual management side. So if I know upfront, if, if that's going to be the uh, case, how should I, or how should anyone approach it? Like, uh, although we know that management are the people who are going to take the decision, but at the same time, since I have 80% of the people who are sitting in a room who are analyst, so I can't just say that, okay, this is the value you can take this or you can do this. So uh, how to go about that? If, if the, that's the situation. Right, that, and that's a very typical situation you've just described. So the goal is to focus on the primary audience. So who's the decision maker? And that's who you should be aiming your information at. The person who can give you the money, the resources, the personnel, wh whatever it is that you are asking for or recommending. So focus your attention on them with uh, a nod to the rest of the people in the audience. And by that, I mean, if you are going to explain a concept that 20% of the audience doesn't know, but 80% does, but your 20% are the ones who are the primary audience who are going to make the decision, you can say something like, well, as you know, p-value indicates this. And so it kind of gives the, the 20%, the people who are making the decision to be like, oh, yes, yes, I've heard of p-value. I know that that's important, but I don't have to pretend like I really know what it is. And the more technical people are like, got it. Yep, fantastic. We, we understand that. So you can also, when you are using the bottom line up front, it's the more general information that you start with, right? The most important, the takeaway. And as you get more detailed, you can say, I'm going to go deep about this technical concept unless you don't want me to, and I can skip over it. And we can talk about this offline with people who want to hear more details about the technical aspects. So it, it's okay to adjust, and, and it's hard, but it's okay to adjust on the fly if you're realizing that your audience either wants more technical or wants less technical. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that does. I actually have faced a lot of issues like this, so. Yes, yeah. it's you. very difficult, isn't it? It's hard. Yeah, it's, it's, hard it's very hard to actually uh, give that trade off. Uh, thank you, but. Absolutely. All right, well, that was the last question we had ready to go. Um, I didn't wanna give anyone else the chance to ask a question before we wrap up. Um, so if you have any more, please feel free to enter them into the chat. Um, and while we wait to see if we have any, um, Dr. Egan Warren, do you have any final parting words before we wrap up today's presentation? I, I just wish you all great presentation experiences. It is such a important skill to have, and I encourage you to keep working on it and keep honing those presentation skills and communication skills so that everyone can know how awesome that you are. Awesome. Well, that's all we have for today. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to learn about storytelling with your data. Um, and this recording, this presentation has been recorded and we will send that out to you via email and post on our YouTube channel. So thank you again. And let's give Dr. Egan Warren one more hand of a um, round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Egan Warren. Thank you.